Our confession comes from the third chapter of Genesis, starting at verse 8. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will will strike his heel. Let us pray. Creative, compassionate God, you delight to shape the world in beauty and harmony. You invite us to participate in the balance of creation. We grow in wisdom as our experience unfolds. We take good learning out of difficult situations yet also find our well-meant endeavors leading to unintended consequences. Too often we give in to temptation that disrupts the joyous, chaotic order of the universe. We cannot undo all our mistakes. We can turn once more to the living presence of Jesus and find new ways to live and love each other and the earth. Do not let our hearts be fearful but let us in silence acknowledge our sin and seek the forgiveness that restores your peace. Psalm 130 Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. O Lord, hear my voice. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you were to keep watch over sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, in order that you may be feared. I wait for you, O oh Lord, my soul waits. In your word is my hope. In your word is my hope. In your word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who keep watch for the morning. More than those who keep watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord there is plentiness redemption, for the Lord shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Your word is my hope. Your word is my help. Let us now enter into a time of embodied blessing and healing. At a protest against anti-Asian racism, Black and Asian ministers shares, shared stories of embodied hurt and a form of an embodied movement as nonverbal gestures of healing and blessing. In solidarity with our Asian American and Pacific Islander siblings in Christ, I invite you to join me in this embodied blessing and healing. First, I will demonstrate with a brief explanation, and then I invite you to follow me, and we will move together in silence at the last. First, take a breath and exhale. Place your hand on your heart. I see myself 
acknowledge my own feelings and my own body. Bow, acknowledging sacredness, resilience, humanity, strength in myself. Look around, I see you. Cup hands to your ears, I hear you. Fold your arms across your chest, mourning, feeling collective sadness, grief, lament, anger. Bow, acknowledging sacredness, resilience, humanity, and strength in others. Open hands, palms up with a breath, receiving blessings from God and from one another. Touch one hand and extend the other to another person. Heart to heart compassion. Let us now begin this embodied blessing and healing together in silence. Let us begin by taking a breath. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. As Adam and Eve faced the consequences of their sin, our God prepared a way for them still to be connected to the earth and to the living presence of God. From out of the depths, God gathers our sins and hears our cries. Our soul awaits and keeps watch for the morning. With our whole selves, our fully perfect and beautifully imperfect bodies, we are drawn together to find healing and to be a blessing. In Christ's life, ministry, death, and resurrection, we are made to be able to persist upright and strong, for our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Today, I am bringing greetings to you from the Schaefer Ashmead Chapel at United Lutheran Seminary in Philadelphia. This is a very special and meaningful space for me. This is where my friends and I came to pray and worship as we were being formed to be leaders in this church. It's also where I learned each part of the liturgy and where I became enamored by its beauty. And so thank you, President Irwin, for sharing this space with us all and to Zach Dean, who is with us this morning, making sure that we are able to get this greeting to you. And so with that, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome. Welcome to our all synod worship and this celebration of God's word. This year has been challenging to say the least. Rituals and routines were disrupted. We were reminded that COVID-19 was not the only pandemic our nation struggles with as communities across the country began to awaken to the trauma of racism that has stolen far too many lives and festered for far too long. In spite of and because of this struggle, we've learned to be church in new and innovative ways together. In all the uncertainty we face, God's word remains, confronting our fears and our sins, challenging us with prophetic calls for justice, comforting us in our sorrows, inspiring and stirring us with a mighty wind. And when death seems to have the last word, God's word is our hope. Thank you to my friend and colleague, Bishop Yehiel Curry of the Metro Chicago Synod of the EOCA for accepting the invitation to preach the gospel message this morning. And to all who have shared their time and gifts to make this moment possible. All powerful God, in Jesus Christ, you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The Gospel according to Mark, the third chapter. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. For they had said he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Bishop Layla Ortiz in the Metropolitan Washington, D.C. Senate of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, thank you 
for this wonderful invitation. As both of our Senates conclude their 2021 Senate assemblies this weekend, I bring you greetings on behalf of the awesome Metropolitan Chicago Senate, your siblings in Christ. In the years that I was a parish pastor, I was busy, but I don't ever remember feeling so active as I do now, and it's weird during the pandemic. I think we would all agree this is an interesting season, elected at the front end of a pandemic. Just before George Floyd's death, and in the midst of chaos at the Capitol, which for me meant learning to navigate crowds and having anxiety-inducing conversations with exhausted communities in public, while at the same time lamenting true opportunities for Sabbath, confessing feelings of inadequacy and uncertainty, with my family in private. It's a lot. Indeed, my friends, our work as the church is good work. It is a calling. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And for all of us, especially in years like this past one, it's okay to acknowledge that sometimes it's a lot. I know I have some roster leaders that understand what I'm talking about. I know there are some council members and lay leaders who have said it's a lot. I know there's some Senate Assembly planning teams who can relate. Early in Mark's Gospel, a book that begins with the words, this is the beginning of good news. We learn that good news aside, Jesus' public ministry, a ministry that by all measures should have been met with love and amazement, was met perhaps more time than not with conflict and tension. Jesus recruits, heals, exercises demons, and even forgives sins already by the time before we reach chapter 3 of Mark's gospel. Jesus preaches and teaches in word and deed, eating with sinners and tax collectors, healing on the Sabbath, and so on. As a result, and perhaps unintentionally, it seems that Jesus' activity has gathered a crowd, many of whom are unhappy with them. Community members, religious leaders, and a dozen or so disciples continually gather around him in a space of tense anticipation, some watching, some plotting, and all of them waiting to see what might happen next. Will we be offended? Or will we be healed? Will we kill them? Or will we find new life? Whatever momentum Jesus has gained, whatever charisma he has exuded, whatever popularity has been produced among the people, these first three chapters of the Gospel of Mark illustrate something of a rocky start to Jesus' public life and ministry. Whatever his progress, there are some clear bumps in the road. I'm sure I got some graduates who understand bumps in the road. I'm sure I got leaders waiting on calls and positions, those who have moved to new cities or started new relationships that understands a rocky start. And when there's a rocky start, there's some critique but from your family? I can understand critique, but Jesus' family was involved. Those who he loved in private were becoming enemies 
of his public ministry. They went to take charge of him, says our text. For it was believed that he was out of his mind. Perhaps he's possessed, they wondered. Perhaps he had a demon. Perhaps he is the king of demons. And that's why he has such power. At the very least, conventional wisdom could testify that Jesus' unorthodox style was somewhat foolish. Come on, you can hear the crowd saying in Jesus' day, why mess with tradition, Jesus? Why shake things up? Why fix what nobody asks you to fix? Performing miracles on the Sabbath? Supper with sinners? Why so in your face, Jesus? Are you going out of your way to make some kind of political point? Aren't we already polarized enough these days? Can you stop already with the controversies? Who cares about the least, the last, and the lost? Can't you see that your words are dividing us? I swear he's either out of his mind or possessed. No wonder they're plotting against him. Can't you hear the voices of the crowd? And when news arrived that Jesus' family were near, the text tells us someone found Jesus as he was teaching. And they let him know, your mother and your brothers are outside. Of course, Jesus, being Jesus, seized the opportunity to create a teachable moment. I don't know about you, but I feel like in the gospel text, Jesus is always expanding our idea about family. Here are my mother and my brothers. He said, looking into the eyes of those who circled him. You friends are my siblings. Indeed, whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever does God's will is my family. And just like that, Jesus is merging ministries. He's merging public with private. The crowd is now the community. The community, now the assembly, and the assembly, now family. You see, in this time and space of tension, despite their accusations, and despite the ponderings in the hearts of even Jesus' family, Jesus was not there to perform miracles. He was not an actor. He was not selling anything. And he certainly didn't have a demon. Jesus was there to heal them and to make a family of a world that seemed hell-bent on making each other into demons. No doubt, the bond of family was a strong one. So was the calling of faith toward the work of God's reign. The crowds, his family, the religious leaders. For Jesus, these were not separate groups. Rather, one people in need of a healing. One people in need of justice. One people in need of grace and reconciliation and love. They were one people in need of humanization, a softening of hearts, a metanoia. It's unclear what transformations or epiphanies took place. But between chapter 3 
In chapter 4 of Mark's gospel, one thing is clear. They're still gathered around Jesus at the beginning of chapter 4. While gathered around him, they were one. Gathered to be fed, to be healed, and to be set free. Gathered to discern and to do the will of the creator. At least as they gathered around the table of Christ's love in search of God's will, they were family. Family. Metro D.C. Senate, let us continue the work of cultivating love and healing. Family, this is indeed God's work. It's a calling, and it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, family, it's a lot. Amen. Tú que estás en los que aman de verdad, el reino que se nos prometió, llegue pronto a nuestro corazón y el amor que tu hijo nos dejó ese amor habite en nosotros y en el pan de la unidad Cristo danos tú la paz y olvídate de nuestro error Si olvidamos el de los demás No permitas que caigamos en el mar Oh Señor y ten piedad del mundo Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga a nosotros tu reino. Hágase tu voluntad en la tierra como en el cielo. Danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día. Perdona nuestras ofensas como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden. Y no nos dejes caer en tentación. Y líbranos del mal. Porque tuyo es el reino, tuyo es el poder y la gloria, ahora y por siempre. Amén. Y en el pan de la unidad, Cristo danos tu la paz. Y olvídate de nuestro error. Olvidamos el de los demás, no permitas que caigamos en el mal, oh Señor, y ten piedad del mundo, y ten piedad. El mundo. Oh God, 
You form all humanity to bear your divine image, and you intend for everyone to live together in harmonious dignity. We pray for all people, in joy and in sorrow, for such a time as this. Creator God, grant us the grace to grow deeper in our respect of and care for your creation. Help us to recognize the sacredness of all of your creatures as signs of your wondrous love and help us turn from the selfish consumption of resources meant for all and to see the impacts of our choices on the marginalized. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, we ask you for our nation, the divisions, hatred, inequalities, racism, violence, cease and that the values of the gospel as peace, equality, welfare, social justice, tolerance, but above all those who love prevail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wind and fire, we pray for your holy church. We give you thanks for all the past saints and witnesses of your love, justice, and grace. All those who have shared the gospel through words and actions. In this time of pandemic, we have been reminded that we are not a church of buildings, stained glass windows, pews, and steeples. We are a church of people. Grant us the wisdom to see what really matters and the resilience to let go of what doesn't. Grant us the courage to change ourselves and our institutions so that we can faithfully share your gospel truth in this time and beyond. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Kind and caring Father, our hearts are heavy and burdened over those we care for and those we have lost. Strengthen us by your spirit that we may continue to care for and grieve with those of your children who are hurting no matter where they may be. Bless us with the reassurance that we do have each other to lean on and depend on in our times of need. Lord, and your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift these prayers to you and all else that we carry with us along the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our loving Savior, amen. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with the scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us all with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake so that grace as it extends to more and more people may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what we can see, but at what we cannot see. For what we can see is temporary, but what we cannot see is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Siblings in Christ, go into all the world. Go forth with forgiveness and grace. Go forth with compassion and love. We go as Christ's family for all the world to see. In the name of the divine three in one. Amen. Thank you. 